So you've written a book on the unspeakable. How did you get interested in this topic? What got me interested in the topic of um, the limits of language and ineffability and unspeakability was the fact that so many people report um, extraordinary experiences, for example, in aesthetic contexts or in religious contexts. And what they uh, usually say is something like they had a feeling that um, they learned something very substantial in those moments, for example, while listening to a very moving Mala symphony or something like that. But when pressed to say what it was, what the inside consisted in, they find themselves um, at a lack of words, so they cannot express what it is, what the inside consisted in. But the feeling remains that something very profound was transmitted in those moments, and so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to explore what could be an explanation for that, metaphysically speaking. Did you experience something like that yourself, or did people um, close to you experience um um, these unspeakable um, yeah things. I think I think it's a pretty common phenomenon even though it feels extraordinary but um, I'm sure most people know the feeling of being really overwhelmed in the face of a piece of art be it a painting or um, a piece of poetry or music is also very very has very very uh, 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 has a strong way of pushing people into these experiences uh, so I think it's not something totally outlandish that, you know, people haven't, haven't experienced themselves. Yeah. And how come um, you talk about religious, religious and artistic experiences? What, what are the similarities between the two and the differences between the two? Mm. So I think the similarities between the two are that they... Um, feel extremely meaningful to the subjects having those experiences. Uh, they seem to, as I said, um, transport a kind of content or a kind of um, ineffable insight that is impossible to put into words. But at the same time, it moves us profoundly. It can even change the way we see the world, the way we look out into the world. I think that's um, uh, something they have in common. It's not only in religious and aesthetic contexts that people have these experiences. So I think philosophy is a context where people actually experience um, pretty fundamentally changing um, moments where they have insights that are perhaps not easy to express in language. I was going to ask you um, about how different philosophers across history, from uh, Lao Tse to Wittgenstein, have thought about the unspeakable? Because you touch upon that in your research, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, this so is for a lay audience, <coughs> so it's not okay. for fellow philosophers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, so the, um, the concept of ineffability shows up over and over again in the history of philosophy, but it shows up um, according to w which period we're talking about, it shows up in different contexts. So Lao Tzu, for example, um, in, in, in ancient China, he referred to the Tao uh, as the main sort of, well, it's very difficult to define, but as the sort of fundamental principle of reality, and that is also fundamentally ineffable. So here the ineffable is something that is out there in the world. Whereas um, perhaps, well, who can I think of? Schopenhauer, much later on, Related the aesthetic, uh, related the ineffable to um, the will, which is also uh, a main principle of reality. And he thought that art and specifically music could put us in touch with the will, with the main principle of reality. Um, but here, our experience of this principle is in a much more personal context. So it's. It has been there as a concept all the time, but it has changed the way it was presented and the context in which it was presented. Who are you closer to in terms of how you see the ineffable? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure. I think both of them uh, got something very, very right. I think the philosopher that influenced me the most with regard to the ineffable was Adorno. He believed that um, on the one hand, it's philosophy's task to try and express the ineffable, 
the essential truths about reality, but at the same time he believed that language would necessarily fail uh, doing at, at doing that. So there was this, there is this constant paradox that we're trying to get at something with our language while we already know that we cannot get at it. And I think that's, that's what speaks to me the most. Why is it philosophy rather than art or religion, like the, the things that actually provoke these, um, these powerful emotions? Sorry, why is it philosophy? Why is it philosophy that can um, um, express the ineffable rather than art or religion? the sources of, of the, the, these feelings, these overwhelming feelings? Well, I think none of them can express it. I mean, s certainly philosophy cannot express the ineffable, but what philosophers do and what I try to do in my book is to uh, examine the conditions under which we have ineffable experiences and what that might tell us about the underlying metaphysics. Uh, I think, if anything, probably art is a better expressive medium um, for effing the ineffable, as it were. But of course, um, it's difficult to give uh, a proper description of how art achieves that, what, what aesthetic expression consists in. Mm. And um, what do you think, so these experiences are quite like um, extraordinary in the sense that um, you know, they get you out of your ordinary life and routine. Um, what is their impact on our day-to-day -day lives? I think that depends on what we make of those experiences and that in turn depends on all kinds of background concepts we already have. So for example, if you're already a religious person and you have an experience like that, chances are you're going to link it up somehow with your prior religious beliefs. Whereas if you're an atheist, then you might come up with something else. I don't know what that might be. Um, I think the the effect these experiences often have, perhaps particularly in, in aesthetic contexts, is that we just see our environments in different ways. And sometimes these experiences can have really long-lasting effects. So, yeah. Um, and moving on to the other um, subject um, that you mentioned you, you will be talking about later, mm -hmm. maths and philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is your take on it? What, what, how did you become interested in the philosophy of maths? I became interested in the philosophy of maths uh, for a number of reasons. I think numbers or mathematical objects in general are very, very interesting objects of study. But one thing I noticed was that um, philosophical questions that are being asked in different areas of philosophy are very, very similar. But philosophers working in these different fields tend to not really talk to each other very much. And in particular, uh, philosophy of mathematics works in a relatively isolated way and so only only recently philosophers have started picking up on parallels between philosophy of maths on the one hand and uh, ethics for example or metaethics on the other hand and they've started drawing very interesting con uh, analogies between these two different domains mm -hmm. and so that's what I'm I'm researching I'm researching the evidential force of using mathematics as a conceptual model Okay, that sounds like very far removed from uh, oh. you know the, the daily uh, kind of experience. How how did you um, you know what? I don't even know where like where you start <laughs> with something like that. Um, are you analyzing then mathematics and the structures of, ma of mathematics <coughs> kind of in the abstract or um, the way that applies to the way we perceive reality? Or? Um, so I think it might be helpful to think about it in, to, to illustrate what I'm talking about to uh, consider how the relationship between mathematics on the one hand and the empirical sciences on the other hand has developed. So in ancient Greece, uh, mathematics was considered the highest form of knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge about eternal forms, um, and so it was, as it were, eternal truths that mathematics embodies. Whereas the empirical world was a world of mere opinion, we could only form beliefs about the empirical world, but we could never have actual knowledge about the empirical world. So mathematics and the empirical world were very, very far removed from one another. And that changed during the times of the scientific revolution. 
when um, Galileo coined the term of mathematics being the language of the book of nature. So all of a sudden science and mathematics be be became two sides of the same project as it were. And then later on again, um, the for sort of the fortunes of mathematics got a lot worse. Uh, so during empiricist times in the 19th century, mathematics was only considered a, a tool for the empirical sciences and only empirical knowledge was considered well-grounded knowledge. And today we're at a point where mathematical reality sort of exists independently of our empirical reality and there are intersections in the area of applied mathematics, but there is also a large part of mathematics that is completely independent from the empirical world. And we use that part of mathematics, we use this idea of mathematics as this unified whole uh, where all truths are fully determinate. Um, we use that as a model when we think about other things in our lives. For example, when we think about ethics or metaphysics and philosophy or even religion, we want all these domains to look as much as possible like mathematics, fully determinate, um, one answer to every open question, etc., etc. And so, um, yeah, I'm interested in uh, the extent to which mathematics has influenced our conceptualization of these different areas. Is it problematic that we want ethics to function like maths? <laughs> it is, it is problematic uh, in some sense, and, and it might actually not be the correct picture of mathematics anymore. So that's, that's also what triggered my interest in this project, that it looks like mathematics is moving towards a very robustly pluralistic picture of the mathematical realm. So it turns out that in some, in some area of mathematics, notably in set theory, some mathematicians have suggested that um, we should give up the hunt for the, the one unique correct answer to open mathematical questions and just accept that there are different mathematical universes in each one, in, in each one of which uh, the same mathematical statement can be sometimes true and sometimes false. And this is an, an approach in mathematics that is taken very, very seriously. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what that might mean for other areas of our lives where, um, where we're still thinking in terms of one unified whole. And given that mathematics has always influenced the way we thought about other aspects of reality, I think also the pluralistic move in mathematics will have a long-term effect. So in terms of ethics, does that, um, <coughs> does a more pluralist um, approach to maths also encourage a more pluralist approach to ethics or a more relativist, more, uh, relativistic one? Um, so that's what I'm thinking about at the moment and I'm, my guess is that yes, there might be connections. I think certainly it might turn out that we don't need definite answers to all the questions we're asking. It might be that in order to get along uh, in sort of in, in our life together with other human beings, we do need to decide on certain very fundamental uh, 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 questions. But it might be the case that sort of higher order questions we don't need to answer in a definite way. And I think that would already be a pretty revolutionary um, result if that if that's what happened in the oh, foreseeable thank you future. So much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.